morning. Nice to see all of you here today. Thank you so much for coming. My name is Pastor Jim, and we are absolutely thrilled that you're here today. As uh, you may have been able to tell from uh, your program when you came in, or maybe from uh, what's already been said, this is a very special weekend for us here at Fellowship Emirates. We are celebrating the 10th anniversary of our church. It was on January the 26th, 2006, that the first service was held for Fellowship of the Emirates. Yeah, it's a wonderful thing. And we are so happy that you have been able to come and be a part of, uh, of this celebration. Uh, we're going to be uh, obviously getting, having the service today, all three services, and then there's something special uh, tomorrow night that we'll let you know about uh, later in the service. But one of the things we want to do is to uh, meet and thank some of the people who had the most to do with this church getting started, those people who were the earliest members, the founders, as well as those that came very shortly thereafter. And uh, what, what we'd really like to do is to, uh, first of all, um, recognize the person in whose home this church really began. And her name is Rhonda McClellan. And if uh, Fellowship of the Emirates has a mother, then she's it. So we are all her children in a way. So I'm going to ask Rhonda if she would come up and uh, let's uh, meet her. Thank you. Come up. Have a seat. Good to see you. How are you? Well, I didn't know I had all these children. <laughs> <laughs> Look at this. It's amazing, huh? I oh, know. Well, Very humbling. So nice to see you again, Rhonda. It's been, I think, what, five years or so since the last time we saw each other. Yeah, thanks and for having us back. We are honored. And thank you so much for bringing your daughter, Emily. Uh, and I'm going to have her stand up again. Gosh, she'll hate me sure. even more. Emily, stand up. This is her yeah. daughter, Emily, who's with her. Thank you, Emily, for coming as well. You can see how excited she was to stand up in front of everyone. She was so thrilled to do that. So, Rhonda, bless you. I know you are living in the U.S. now, and uh, we are just so grateful for what God did through you 10 years ago. And so, if you would, start by just telling us a little bit about kind of how did Fellowship of the Emirates get started? Yeah, so um, we uh, did a purpose-driven life Bible study the mm -hmm. summer of 2005. The book by Rick Warren, Pastor Bert, Rick Warren. Yeah, mm -hmm. and... Um, there was a group of us that after we finished the study, we just really felt led to, to do something more here. Mm -hmm. And um, we prayed. We really, um, I, you know, had a lot of um, meetings about planning another church. And yeah. there were churches here, but we wanted mm -hmm. a different kind of church. Uh, mm -hmm. We wanted one that people felt welcomed and they felt loved mm. the minute they walked in the door. Mm. And uh, we, we wanted to reach those that were not perfect. None of us are perfect. And so we mm -hmm. didn't want you to feel like you had to be perfect when you walked in the door. Mm. And we wanted you to feel loved and we wanted you to just know that um, we wanted Christ's love to throw, flow through us and, and to you as you walked in. Mm -hmm. So um, it, was, it was born out of just uh, a need for our children to really be grounded mm -hmm. and uh, for them to have a place where they could invite their friends yeah. and, um, and, and just really have a good time. Following Jesus is a great time. That's, you know, it's absolutely. an adventure. That's right, yeah. Um, and so we, we wanted people to feel that and not feel like church was a burden or that it was a duty or that, you yeah. know, that you had to come. Uh, we wanted it to be a good time for everybody. So yeah. um, that was, and we wanted to reach the unchurched. We wanted... Um, you know, not to pull people away from other churches here because yeah. th they were needed there. Sure. Um, so it was very organic. None of us had any idea about church planning. Mm -hmm. uh, we were just a motley crew of uh, very, very ordinary people. I, I, uh, we had hospitality people. We had some engineers. We had some business people, some organizational people. We had teachers. Yeah. Um, and God just brought us all together and... I'm still, I'm really overwhelmed. Um, so Jim. are we. We still are. Yeah, that hasn't <laughs> changed. But thank you so much for having the, the vision and not only that, but just the relationship with, with God you had in Christ. Mm -hmm. Because those very same things that you valued and treasured were the, were the DNA that you passed on to all of us who've come after I you. I love the hug team. I know. Isn't that great? Yeah. We, I told her earlier, she didn't realize that's that we awesome. had a group of people who are actually, this was their job, and they're called the hug team, which is for helpers, ushers, and greeters, but mainly they're for hugging. And if you, they'll hug you if you don't run away from them. I mean, they're, they're <laughs> hugger people. But anyway, it's because you were like that. And as a result of that, fellowship has always been a place of love, of joy, of, uh, of openness, of grace. You know, it's a place where people can come as they are. 
and, and come and inquire and find out about God. So it's wonderful. So speaking of God, obviously, I know you've told me uh, you felt carried along in this whole process, I'm sure, mm -hmm. by God. And it seemed like every time a problem or need would come up, he would supply the right person or place or whatever it may be. He did. And it was just amazing the times when we just felt so totally drained. Yeah. I'm like, God, really, you put us here? How, how are we going to do this? We, yeah. We're not equipped for this. He would bring people, yeah. you know, we would be sitting by somebody somewhere and we would just share about the church and they would like, oh, we're, we've been searching for some, mm -hmm. some place to go. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, just in conversations, yeah. they, they, they would have exactly what we needed. Yeah. And, um, and that was with you too, Jim. Oh, you know, hey. it was amazing. Was, just was, uh, uh, Thank you. Thank oh, you. God bless yeah. you. Thank you for saying that. Yeah. Yeah, you're too kind. Yeah. Thank you. I mean, it, 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 was a, it was a dream place to come. And when we came in 2008 and, and met this uh, small group that was there mm -hmm. then even, and, but, but their hearts were just so full of exactly the things you've described. And that's what my wife and I were looking for. We searched the earth and we found the perfect place. This wow. is it. So tell us, <laughs> it, uh, words of maybe uh, encouragement you would have for us or wisdom uh, on this uh, 10th anniversary. Yeah, I, I would say... Um, to those of you who are sitting on the sidelines and not sure you mm. want to jump in, jump in. <laughs> You'll receive that blessing. Mm. It, it is, um, I, you know, God's equipped us, all of us, with something very special, mm. and he wants us to use it. And, you know, it could be, you know, I have to tell you, I'm from a small town in Pennsylvania. I had never really been out of the country until uh, I, I got married, and and... This is very humbling to have thought that, I'm now 55, but um, to think that I would be up here on stage, you know, um, after having been a part of this amazing journey, hmm. anybody, it, he calls anybody to, to do this. Mm -hmm. And um, you're here for a reason, and I encourage you to get involved. I encourage you to read The Purpose Driven Life um, behind the Bible. Um, and uh, just be um, blessed because when you serve, you're blessed. So, um, uh, you know, we had people that um, were from different congregations and different places um, and kind of felt tied to their home churches, hmm. and that's, that's good. Uh, but invest here hmm. because people need, they, they are away from their families. Mm -hmm. So they need to be poured into, they need to be loved, they need to be encouraged, they need to be edified and lifted up. This is a very, very busy, fast-paced life, uh, and we can get really sucked into that. Um, but spend time with each other. Mm. There's no greater gift that you can give people, your families, your friends, mm. is time. So I encourage you all to just pour into each other, be there for each other. Um, even in this busyness of, of Dubai. Um, so uh, I, I'm just grateful for this opportunity. Mm. Thank you so Thank much you. for inviting Thank us you. back. Thank you for those great words. God really bless wonderful. You all. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Would it would it be possible you to come back every week and give that talk? Because we really need to hear that. That's very inspirational. Thank you. Well, Can from a from a <laughs> From a heart that's been there. Yeah, um, we, you sound yeah. like it. You yeah. know exactly so. what's going through. Still happening. The very same thing. Thank Just you. more people. Yeah. Very same challenges. <laughs> same God, though. Yeah, same so, God. Can yeah. I pray for you? Please. Can yes, I do that? Thank you. You're welcome. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Rhonda and uh, her family. Thank you so much for um, uh, Emily and her uh, brother and sister. Thank you for the whole McClellan family. Thank you for uh, her husband, Mac, and for the fact that they opened their home and were willing to step up and say, uh, if no one else will do it, we will. If no one else will pay, we will pay. If no one else will lead, we will lead. Father, we so desperately need uh, so many people like that now to reach the opportunities and the, and the folks that you're sending to Dubai and those now and in the future of Futeri. Lord, we just thank you so much for what you did to give us uh, the Fellowship of the Emirates through this family and the others who helped her. And we just pray your blessings on Rhonda in Nashville. I know you've got great things for her to do there. We pray your blessings on uh, her children at university. Pray your blessings on Emily. And Lord, you would uh, just help her as she finishes her schooling. Uh, Lord, um, we recognize that it's you, but you have to have people to use. And I thank you that these people were willing to be used by you to start this church. 
Bless them, Father. This we pray in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 God bless you, dear. Thank you so much for coming. Yeah. It was uh, Nelson Mandela who once said, remember to celebrate milestones as uh, you prepare for the road ahead. I think what he was talking about was how important it is that ever so often in whatever endeavor you may be in, to stop, take a look back, see where you've come from in order to try to figure out where it is you need to go. And so that's probably some pretty good advice for us today. As we celebrate this 10th anniversary, we are truly thrilled beyond words. We are amazed. As Rhonda shared just a few minutes ago, uh, the person whose home our church began, uh, no one could ever envision what God has done here. It truly is. And, and so we want to celebrate this weekend um, and, and just really have a great time. And we also want to be sure and, of course, acknowledge the one who made it all possible, and that's God. It's him, and it's amazing what he's done. And although part of our purpose this weekend is to recognize the countless number of people, especially that small group who huddled together in 2006 and said, you know, the, Dubai could use a church where people can just come be themselves, a church where anyone is welcome, a church where people can, can be, feel like a family. And, and we really ought to do that. Well, who's going to do it? Well, I guess maybe, you know, we should. And, and so we recognize today that we stand on the shoulders of those who have come before us. And, and we want to honor them. But at the same time, they would be the first to say that, again, there's only one, one who needs to get all the, the praise and the glory. And that, of course, is God. I'm reminded of that verse when Paul was writing Timothy, the very end of Paul's life, one of his very last letters. And he was writing his young protege, Timothy, and he wrote this to him. He said, now to the king eternal, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. And that's exactly how any of us who have had anything to do with fellowship over these last 10 years feel. We recognize, I mean, I've been talking to some of the early members at a dinner we had last night. Certainly, uh, Rhonda and I have talked about it. It just seems like all the time, whenever something needed to happen, God would open a door. Whenever somebody was needed to come and teach a class or come and, uh, uh, and do something in the church, God would provide just the right person at the right time. It's really been like being on a river and God knew the course, and he was taking this, the twists and turns through the rapids. Uh, sometimes there'd be a waterfall. We'd turn at the last minute and just miss it. It was that kind of thing, and it's been that way the whole way through. You know, this, uh, a few weeks ago, I was in the U.S., and I went to a, a bookstore, as I often do, a Christian bookstore. And I usually bypass all the gifts and stuff and go straight, you know, to the books and the, and the software and stuff. That's what I'm interested in. But uh, there was a sign I saw that I liked so much, I took a picture of it. And I thought it was really, it's this sign. I love these kids' faces. And this sign says, sometimes I just look up, smile, and say, I know that was you, God. You know, that's, that's the way we feel, right? I know that was you, God. We saw you. You did it. it reminds me of one of my favorite baseball stories. I, I like baseball. And uh, back during World War II, many of the great baseball players, uh, I, you know, enlisted to fight in the war. And so even though they had uh, baseball continued, uh, the, the president, uh, Roosevelt, said that the country needed baseball, you know, during this time of great sadness and, and, and trial. So, so they played, but obviously the teams were kind of just a patchwork team. But anyway, when the great players began to come back, it was a, a, a happy day for every fan. And one of the greatest was, of course, Joe DiMaggio, who was gone for several years serving in the, in the military. And so he came back, and he was, uh, of course, the great Yankee slugger for the New York Yankees. And he was ready to join the team in a couple of days, but he just couldn't wait. He wanted to go see a game. So he took his young son, Joe Jr., who was only five years old at the time, and he, uh, uh, Joe uh, Sr. put on a hat and sunglasses, and he thought, you know, he could go incognito. Nobody would see him. So he went to the game, and, but it didn't work, you know. He was only like two innings into the game, and somebody said, that's Joe DiMaggio. And then the word started spreading. Here was Yankee Stadium was packed, 50,000 people. And the word just spread it like wildfire. Joe DiMaggio's back. Joe DiMaggio's back. And slowly this chant began, Joe, Joe. Joe, and, and over time, it just became thunderous. Joe, 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 the great Joe DiMaggio is back. And, and you know, obviously a, a little embarrassed, but really flattered, uh, Joe DiMaggio turned to his little son, Joe Jr., and he said, do you hear that, son? And the little boy didn't miss a beat. He just looked up at his dad and said, I know, Dad, everybody knows me. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of how we feel, you know? It's like, hey, look what's happened, you know? And God's going, yeah, I know down there exactly. What's going on? I know what parts you played, you know, is me. So anyway, 
What we want to talk about today is what does our past teach us? As we think about these past 10 years, what can we learn about today at Fellowship? What can we learn about where Fellowship will be in the future as the Lord Jesus tarries? So what we want to ask is, what is the purpose of fellowship? Why, why did he bring it into existence? What is the heartbeat of this church? What keeps it going? What sustains us? What is the reason why we're all here? And you know, when you stop and, and really kind of step back and take a look at the church, I mean, just look at it today. I mean, it's incredible uh, all that God has blessed us with. And uh, not just the number of people who come and who come and go and then come again, fill up the chairs. I mean, it's just incredible. Uh, those of you in Platinum City, you know what I'm talking about. Those of you who are watching at home, it's, it's remarkable. But also just the number of ministries that we now are able to have at the church, uh, the small groups that meet the needs, uh, the 242 groups. There's so many things that are going on. It's the, the outreach to Syrian refugees. I mean, I think we counted up the other day, there's over 20 different ministries that happen every week or nearly every week at Fellowship. We are thrilled to be able to be involved in all these things. And so it seems a little complicated when you say, well, what is fellowship? What is everybody doing? Well, interestingly enough, though, when you really boil it all down, and that's kind of what we've been doing the last few weeks, thinking about this celebration, when you really boil it all down, the real purpose of fellowship in reality is pretty simple. It's as simple as the, a story that Jesus told about a lost sheep. In Luke chapter 15, Jesus said, what men among you, and this is an unusual way for Jesus to begin his stories. You know, Jesus told a lot of stories. We have like 50 of them in the New Testament. Uh, obviously, those are just the ones that recorded in the Gospels. Jesus probably told hundreds of stories. I can't wait to get to heaven and hear some of the ones that didn't get recorded. And most of the time, he would start a story by saying, well, there was a certain man, and he went and did so-and-so, or, uh, or there was a certain man who had this profession, he did such and such, or he would even name a person. You know, there was a man named so-and-so, and this is what happened to him. But this time, he uses an introductory phrase that would have been, just brought everybody right in with him. He said, what man among you doesn't have a hundred sheep and then loses one and doesn't leave the 99 to go find the lost sheep? And everybody went, mm-hmm, yeah, mm-hmm. Yeah, it happened to me one time when I was a boy. I was a shepherd, and I lost one. And what daddy was going to say, oh, man, I couldn't go home without finding it. Yeah, I know exactly what he's talking about. And Jesus said, and so he leaves the 99 in the open pasture and he goes and he searches until he finds the sheep. And when he finds it, he picks it up, he puts it on his shoulders and he carries it all the way home. And when he gets home, he calls all of his friends and neighbors and he says, come, join me. We're going to celebrate. Rejoice with me. My sheep, which was lost, has been found. And all of them went. I, I, I had that happen not long ago, and, and I know exactly. It feels so wonderful when you have something so valuable as a sheep because, hey, these people didn't have a lot. And so when you lose a sheep and you find a sheep, it's a good day. And they said, let's celebrate that really, really good day. And, and, and again, one of the things you need to remember about this is that the story Jesus told here, and he tells it one other time over in Matthew 18, but it's really for a different purpose. He's talking about something else. It's interesting how he kind of took the story and changed it just slightly in order to illustrate something else having to do with humility and, 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 and children. But here in this one, he's talking about a lost big sheep. So this is not a little lamb, you know, that the shepherd picks up and, you know, he's so warm and cuddling. And puts, you know, he says, oh, we're going to go home. Come on, you know, it's easy walking. These sheep can be heavy. You know anything about sheep? Uh, some, some of you probably do. I mean, the, how, anybody here from New Zealand in, in the crowd? Yeah, anybody here? If you knew, over here? Okay, yeah. You know what I'm talking about? You know sheep, right? Uh, my wife and I spent six weeks in New Zealand uh, a few years ago. We loved it, by the way. But hey, there's more sheep there than there are people on earth. I kid you not. It's the truth. Paradise. You live in paradise. But I mean, there's sheep everywhere. And so while I was there, I said, man, I'm going to learn some things about sheep. So I had an opportunity to talk to some New Zealanders, some Kiwis, and they told me about sheep. So one of the things is sheep can be pretty heavy. You know, they can weigh like 80, 100 uh, K. I mean, you know, you're talking uh, 100 and over 125, 30 pounds. I mean, f sometimes up to 200 pounds. They can be heavy, especially if they have wool on them. And we're talking about now sheep that have been outside in an open pasture, which means it was probably warm weather, which means they probably hadn't been sheared yet. And so they get the sheep and they're, you know, they're, they're, he's bringing him home. And this is tough, tough working. That's what he's talking about. And everybody understood that because they got the picture. Well, it's even more interesting when you learn a little bit about the background of the story. Let me tell you what it is. First of all, here in Luke 15, 1 and 2, look at this. This is what Jesus actually said, uh, the Bible says. Now, all the tax collectors and the sinners were coming near to Jesus to listen to him. Did you hear that? All the tax collectors, who were the most despised people around, they were like, 
you know, uh, turncoats. They were people who the, had gone over to the Romans, and they were making a huge amount of money by oppressing their own people. And the sinners, that was just a general Greek term for people who were generally immoral and, and, and ungodly, essentially. So the tax collectors and sinners were coming to Jesus to listen to him. Now, the Pharisees and the scribes, they were the religious leaders, the, the hoity-toity uh, of the Jewish religion at the time. The Pharisees and the scribes began to grumble, saying, this man receives sinners and eats with them. Notice that, those words, coming near and receives. Now, what's the situation here? Jesus told this story at a time when he was at, his popularity was at its height with the local people, but also at a time when his ad, uh, adversaries were as angry with him as they'd ever been. The Pharisees hated Jesus, the religious leaders. They hated him because he was everything they weren't. Uh, he, Jesus was popular. They weren't. The people were running to hear what he had to say. They weren't coming to the Pharisees that way. It was like, oh, we got to go to, you know, to uh, the uh, tabernacle, to the uh, uh, synagogue again. We got to go to the uh, temple, you know. And it was a sense of oppression and duty and guilt. And, uh, you know, that was essentially what it was all about. They had taken what had been a lovely ex uh, revelation of God's care for his people in the Old Testament. And in between the Old and the New Testaments, they had turned it into an incredible, oppressive series of rules and regulations. And as a result, the people were so oppressed. That's why Jesus says, come unto me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. He's not talking about just working hard during the day. He's talking about all this religiosity that has been piled on the people so they can barely get to God because of that. And as a result, these, uh, they were, the religious leaders were constantly finding ways to try and attack Jesus. They were jealous. They hated him. They couldn't figure him out. They couldn't understand how he was able to do these things. For one thing, he kept talking to them uh, um, uh, about his uh, father in heaven and that that's how we were to relate to God. He actually used the, the word Abba, which means daddy or papa. He said, God is like, a, is like a heavenly papa to us. And the Pharisees said, no, no, he's an angry, judgmental God that will get, get in trouble if you're not just like us, you know, that kind of thing. And here's a picture which I really like, especially like the guy in the middle. See that guy's face? <laughs> I mean, I think the artist has really captured that kind of, Jesus, we hate you, and we're going to kill you if we get the chance of that kind of thing. So this is the, this is the situation. You get it? It's a problem. And, and, of course, Jesus wasn't really helping himself in some ways. And one of the main ways was, guess what? He was making it easy for them to hate him because Jesus was befriending all the local sinners all the tax collectors, all the most dis disreputable and immoral people that were around. Jesus was hanging out with them. He was spending time with them. Isn't that amazing? I mean, he was hanging out with the, you know, the thieves and the adulterers and the pimps and the prostitutes and the cheats and the liars. You know, people just like us. That's his. You know, I did that last service and they didn't laugh either. That's supposed to be like, oh, <laughs> but you didn't. What, you, what have you been doing? You need to come and see me because if that was something you're going, yeah, that's me. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I didn't realize that. All right, this has just gotten a lot more interesting. So this is who Jesus was hanging out with. He was, he, look at this, this is fascinating. This word receives that we read about there a minute ago, it's, it's the Greek word, prosdekomai. The word dekomai means receive, but if when you put the prefix pros on it, which means toward or forward, it's the idea of not just hanging back and kind of, you know, formally receiving someone, hello, how are you? Uh -huh. Good to see you. But I mean, it's going forth and saying, hello, how are you? Yeah, uh, what's your name? My name is Seth. What do you do? Okay, can I come to your house for dinner tonight? You know, it's that kind of thing. It's, a, it's an exchange. Jesus was making friends with people that the Pharisees wouldn't even look at. Jesus was having meals with people you wouldn't even let in your front door today. That's what Jesus was doing. That's who Jesus was befriending. As a matter of fact, the, the Pharisees, one of the few things they ever got right was they said, Jesus is a friend of sinners. And Jesus went, yeah, that's me. Yeah, that's exactly who I am. I have come to seek and to save those who are lost, not those who are so stuck on themselves that they think they do not need forgiveness because they've made their own religion. Wow, absolutely amazing. He was even eating with them, which I mean, is the, I mean that's just the bottom line. If you went and, you know, it's bad enough to be around a sinner, but if you touched him or touched anything he'd had, and if then if you consumed it in his house, I mean, we who live in this culture in Dubai uh, understand what eating with, uh, in this uh, Middle East is like, don't we? Do you understand? I mean, maybe you haven't been here long, I'll tell you. Uh, hospitality is extremely big here. If, if a local invites you to their home, then listen, you are, consider yourself really honored. Because that means something specific. And if they bring you in and serve you food, oh my goodness, they are really making a statement. 
And for you to reject that food would be considered really rude. It would be an offense. What you do is you eat the dates, you drink the coffee, you smile, and you, have, and you spend all evening with them. And, you have, and then you invite them to your home. And this is what, you know, Jesus was going to this home after home, person after person, hanging out with people. This word near, fascinating word from a Greek word, which means to squeeze or press in. So it wasn't like there were, you know, four or five of these <laughs> tax collectors and prostitutes and thieves that were coming to Jesus. They were crowding around him, man. There, I mean, there was a big crowd. They were going to say, where's Jesus? Oh, man, I don't, I don't have any thieving to do right now. I'm going to go over and listen to him, you know. <laughs> they, were just, they were packed in there. That's what I love. Isn't that amazing? That's incredible. Matter of fact, this is a picture from the Renaissance period, a famous picture called uh, Jesus, Friend of Sinners. And you can see Jesus is kind of in the middle there looking real Jesus-ish. And uh, you can see all these, uh, you know, uh, reprobates supposedly around him. And, you know, there's a goat's head on the table and they got a lot of wine. And, and what is that? One guy's got a knife or something. He's probably looking to see who he can rob. You know, it's just a general b band of, of renegades. However, though, <laughs> we don't really relate to all that. I mean, because they all look kind of like stuffed shirts to us, right? So uh, I was uh, doing some research a few weeks ago, uh, uh, thinking about this uh, parable I wanted to talk about. And I came across a blog with a guy who's in a church, uh, Florida or somewhere. Anyway, he said, yeah, he was talking about this very thing. He said, so many of the pictures and depictions of Jesus, friend of sinners we have, don't really relate to us in modern times. So he got his, uh, uh, some people and they went out and shot some pictures of Jesus with sinners today. And this is, this is what he has. Look at this. Here's Jesus hanging out. So when you think of Jesus hanging out with sinners, don't just think about a bunch of guys with togas. Think about people like this, you know, off the streets with the tats, you know, with the grill, with the guns tucked in their waistband, you know, all of that stuff, you know, with the, you know, you see what I'm getting at? Yeah. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not an idiot. I don't know why they couldn't find a better guy to play Jesus. I mean, maybe this is the guy himself. I don't know. But this Jesus looks like a pasty white guy who needs to wash his hair to me, but I don't know who he is. But anyway, so forget him, okay? But picture Jesus in your mind the way you should, and then put him in this scene with these kind of freaks and weirdos and odd fellows, you know, kind of unusual people. Here he is eating with them, okay? I like this scene. Who is this lady coming in the door? Look at her. I mean, whoa. You know, you got a guy with no shirt on and you got all these gangbangers and stuff, and they're just all going, hey, man, this Jesus is cool. Let's tell us another story, Jesus. We love these stories, you know. <laughs> this guy gets us, you know. He gets us, you know, and he doesn't hate us, you know. He, he doesn't join in with what we do, but he treats us as though we had value, as though, we, we, as though he cared about us. And it's been a long time since anybody has cared for somebody that looks like me. You see what I'm saying? This is Jesus this is the real Jesus. And so, look at this. Then he tells this simple story. So you hear all these Pharisees around. Here are these, you can, <laughs> you can imagine the Pharisees on one side of the room and the, and the sinners on the other side, and they're eyeing each other. You know, it's like, man, I wish I could, you know, go off on that guy over there. And the Pharisees are going, boy, I wish they'd die and go to hell. You know, I wish they'd do that right away. And Jesus is in the middle. So what does he do? I got a story for you all. And this is the story he tells. Here are the words of Jesus. One man among you, if he has a hundred sheep, has lost one of them, does not leave the 99. And notice what he says in the open pasture. Now, there's a lot of debate about what this means. First of all, people struggle to understand exactly who are the 99. I think personally Jesus tells us here in just a couple of minutes in verse 7. I think you're going to get the answer. But some people think that these are, you know, followers of Jesus that just are, are a little too stiff. Um, or, you know, they have other issues. Anyway, the, word, the ter term open pasture should give us a clue, though. It's really the Greek word for wilderness. So some people try to translate this and say, oh, Jesus really left uh, the 99 in a cave. I read that in a book, actually. Or he left them, you know, um, uh, with other shepherds. Uh, and, and that's very possible, you know. And, and maybe the, in the culture, the, a lot of those things clicked in. But again, I think we have to take Jesus at his word. He left them in the open pasture, unguarded, unprotected. Why? Well, because they were kind of on their own. Because these people did, felt like they didn't really need a shepherd. I mean, that's going to be the point of it. They're, they're self-righteous religious people, people who are trusting in religion, not in their relationship with the shepherd. The other thing that's interesting, too, is it says open pastures. It probably means that the lost one is in non-open pastures, which means he's probably been up in the mountains, the hills, a dangerous area where there's wild beasts and where there's a lot of places to fall off rocks and crevices and, and, uh, and, and waterfalls and other things like that. And so the shepherd's going to go back into that rather dangerous country in order to find him. He's gonna, it's not going to be an easy climb to get back up there. So he leaves him in the open pastures, and he goes after the one which is lost until he gets tired, and then he comes back and says he shouldn't have got lost in the first place. Is that what it says? 
No, he does what? He goes and he looks until one, until he finds the lost one. And when he has found it, he looks at it and says, bad sheep, bad sheep, what are you doing? Look at all this trouble you've given me. And so he puts a saddle on the thing and rides it back down. Is that what he does? <laughs> Come on, you guys, have a good time, I am. No, he doesn't do that at all. No, that's absolutely not what he does. He what? He leans down and he picks up the sheep, the heavy sheep, and he puts it on his shoulders and he carries the sheep all the way back along the treacherous route, back to the safety. That's what he does. Isn't that amazing? Absolutely amazing. You know why he has to do that? If you know anything about sheep, you know. It's because sheep, when they get scared and lost, become so terrified, they're even scared of the shepherd. The one who used to and when everything's fine, they run to him. The one who they will follow when they're in calm. But when they're in a, a traumatized state, then they're even scared of the shepherd. The shepherd has to be the one because these sheep cannot save themselves. Wow. That's very, very interesting. And so he comes back, and it's interesting, the, the term of the verb here, rejoicing, doesn't mean he just is kind of like, oh, good, the sheep's here. He, but he's rejo He's happy, and he's happy continually. He's coming up, I mean, he's coming up, well, I got the sheep. This is really great. This is wonderful. And he calls out to all his friends and neighbors and says what? Come on over. I, we're going to have the biggest party you've ever seen because, you know, I lost. Now, it's just a beautiful picture, isn't it? I had this uh, seminar professor I dearly loved. I, I don't know if you ever had him or not, Bill. His name was uh, Dwight Pentecost. And he used to ask the question to all of his students, what's the uh, happiest, uh, the, wh wh what chapter in the Bible is, that is the most joyful? And so people would say, oh, I guess it's Revelation when Jesus comes. Or, you know, maybe it's in Bethlehem, Luke, when Jesus was born. No, he would say, no, no, no. He'd say the happiest chapter is Luke 15. Because every story that's told there ends in rejoicing. There's the lost sheep, there's the lost coin, there's the lost son. Happiness, happiness, happiness. All is back. It's a really a lovely picture. Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. Funny, why do sheep wander off so much? Well, because they're sheep. Do you know anything about sheep? Again, let me share with you some of my knowledge. First of all, sheep are not dumb, they're obstinate. A lot of people think, you know, sheep are really stupid. Maybe you've heard that. It's not true. Absolutely not true. Matter of fact, uh, I, I've, I've seen studies where scientists, they've studied the brains of sheep, and they're about the size of a, uh, like a dog's uh, uh, brain. And so, I mean, and, and they were able to tell, I don't know how exactly, how do you tell a dead brain is working? But anyway, they're able to check that out, and they can see that a sheep is, you know, relatively intelligent, can learn things, can remember, can remember people, for example. And over a long period of time that they haven't seen and they can still recognize them, that kind of thing. It shows some intelligence. But yet sheep will do what seem to be really dumb things, like, like walk into a wall and break their neck. Why? Because they just they want to go that way and the wall's in the way and I'm going to get through there. They're obstinate. Not only that, they have a tendency to be naturally curious. You know, sheep will come up to water and see their refraction and keep looking at it. And they're so curious they will go down to touch the sheep and they will fall in the water and drown. <laughs> I kid you not. They do that. Gets them in a lot of trouble. Sheep have no defensive ability against predators. They have, the only thing they can do is to huddle together. Did you know sheep have no teeth on the top, just a gum palate? They only have teeth on the bottom. So even if it's like an animal comes to try and get them, they just go, ooh, 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 like that, and it's <laughs> nothing. It's nothing. Ooh, 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 ooh. That'll stick in your head when you forget everything else about this sermon. I, you'll forget that, but I'm, ooh, 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 ooh. you'll remember that. No ability. Sheep instinctively like to flock. They just love to do that. They love to congregate. However, when they're alone, they become confused, disoriented. No wonder they can't get home. Sheep are easily frightened by things like wind, running water, their own shadow. <laughs> oh, there's something black chasing me. Oh, it's my shadow. Okay, sorry. <laughs> True stories. Uh, the, the noise, any type of noise will scare them. So they're easy. To, now, why do you think Jesus chose sheep as representative of his followers. And the reason is because we're just like sheep, aren't we? I mean, let's be honest, okay? We are not really dumb, but we are very obstinate. Yes? Yes, we are. We are naturally curious and it gets us in big trouble sometimes. Don't you look at that girl. You get out of there. She's no, sheep have no defensive ability against predators. We have no real defense against Satan. Without God, we are, we are helpless. We love to be with people. But it's when we get alone late at night and we start thinking about everything we did with those people, we begin to really be attacked. And boy, it's tough. And we're, we're, we're vulnerable then. Uh, we, uh, we're easily frightened by things. We worry about things. How many of you are worried about something right now? 
How many of you are frightened about what the, this year and the economy? How many of you are afraid uh, of, of maybe you're going to have a doctor's appointment coming up in a few weeks and you're scared? Jesus said, I am the good shepherd and I will take care of you. I'll be there for you. Isn't that great? It's a wonderful, wonderful picture. So what does the good shepherd do? He looks and he looks and he looks. And as we said, it probably was a dangerous search. I mean, uh, it would have been a lot safer for the shepherd to stay down in the good pasture, in the open pasture. But no, he went back in the, in the hills, in the, in the gullies, where he himself could be attacked by bandits or, or animals or things. Matter of fact, there's a famous picture that's been made. It doesn't look anything like <laughs> the, the, the Holy Land at all, but it's a great picture to communicate the love that the shepherd has for the lost sheep. And, and here it is. Here are the predators flying overhead, ready to attack the sheep. I don't know if you can tell or not, but the sheep has got like blood on it. It's hurt. He's ready to fall off this precipice. And here's the shepherd risking his own life. You can't see it. Well, I guess you can if you look really close. No, you probably can't. But in the, uh, in the one I can see, you can see he's got the vines and stuff. And he's been climbing through the, the thicket and through the bushes in order to find the sheep. And he's finally found him. And now he is reaching down and he's going to struggle to get him up from that cliff, but he's going to do that. He's going to take him back. Lovely, lovely picture. And then, of course, there's this amazing rejoicing that happens. Isn't that fantastic? Uh, Jesus said, uh, there is such joy when a shepherd finds a lost sheep. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture. So what's the, what's the moral of this? What's the lesson here? What can we learn from this? Well, interesting enough, Jesus tells us. It's in verse 7. Let me show you what it says. I tell you, Jesus said, that in the same way, just like in the story, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. Now, some think that they mean they are already repented and they're already forgiven. Others think they mean these are self-righteous people like the Pharisees. Because I think, again, you've got to have the yin and the yang. That's, that's personally what I think. If you don't think that, that's okay. We can agree about the lost sheep, okay? Don't worry about it. But I think Jesus' point was in heaven, and how would he know? Because he'd come from there. <laughs> yeah. And so he said, there's more joy in heaven. There's more rejoicing. The angels celebrate when someone who is truly a lost sheep, when someone who is, is broken and beaten and defeated and in the clutches of Satan, when one of them figures it out, figures out who God is and who made them, and who sent his son, Jesus, to come and die for him. When somebody figures that out, oh my goodness, you should see the party that goes on in heaven. Now, the 99, oh, you know, God loves them too. But they're going to have to get over themselves and come to a realization that they've got to be found also. Or they're never going to be with the good shepherd. Ah, it's a great, great picture, isn't it? The more joy in heaven over one sinner than 99 who think they aren't lost. Jesus, the good shepherd, loves every single sinner. Do you understand that? And came to find them. That's what it says. Remember this verse? Very famous verse in John 3, 16. Jesus speaking to a, 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 one of those 99 who came seeking him, a man named Nicodemus. And he said to him, for God so loved the world, he gave his one and only son, so that, what is that word? Say it again. Everyone. That's right. Everyone who believes in him will not perish, but will have eternal life. That's exactly right. We must be willing to trust the shepherd, turn from sin, and let him carry us home. Isn't that a great picture? And, the, and what's the word that Jesus uses? He said uh, there, was, there was more joy in heaven when one lost sinner, what? What was the word he used? Repents. Don't miss that word. It, it's a Greek word made up of two words, the word for uh, 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 again or repeat, and the word to think. And so the idea is, is to think again, to rethink things. It means to literally change your mind, to, to change what you've thought about things, to no longer be thinking about the way you were thinking, but to think another way and as a result to act another way. Used 30 new, 32 times in the Gospels and Acts, 25 times by Luke. I think Luke understood as he interviewed people about Jesus, he kept hearing that word over and over. Well, Jesus said about repentance, and then he said, well, that if people will repent and come to him, and over and over, Luke said, man, I've got to get that word down. That's an important word. Should be an important word for us too. The good shepherd is not someone who just kind of winks at you getting lost all the time, saying, oh, that's just Jim. You know, he just, he, he loves that beep stuff. I mean, he just can't leave it alone. No, that's not it. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that, yeah, sometimes we are lost. Sometimes we get lost repeatedly and he will repeatedly come and find us. But ultimately, the objective is what? To get found and stay found. So, what does this all have to do with fellowship? 
Well, I'm so glad you asked. Let me tell you. Fellowship as a church from its beginning, these 10 years, and by God's grace every year in the future, will be a church that's more focused on reaching the lost sheep than staying with the 99. We want to be a church where lost sheep feel comfortable and can understand and relate to what's being said. We don't want to talk in a lot of religious, religious words. We don't want to talk in such a way that people go, I have no idea what that, that guy was talking about at all. We want to talk about this. We want to be a place where you can come in and say, well, this is people just like me. You know, these people, these people don't think there's any big deal. They're just regular folk. That's what we are. See, the problem is the longer you're in church, the more church has a tendency to drift towards people who who are church people. Matter of fact, there's one of my favorite guys I listen to all the time, a guy named Andy Stanley. He is in Atlanta. He says, every church over time becomes a church for church people. That causes people to think that Jesus is only for church people. Have you ever been in a church like that? It's like you have to know the rules and, the, you know, and everybody's got their own chair or pew. And if you sit there, they kind of look at you like, get out of my pew. What are you doing? You know, get out of here. You know, that kind of thing. Or you feel awkward or funny or, again, you just can't relate at all. Have you ever been in a place like that? Do you feel judged or rejected? Maybe you come in and, you know, you didn't know exactly what to wear. And so you got shorts on and, you know, everybody else is in a suit and tie. And they're looking at you like, sinner, sinner, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. And you're going, hmm, I'm so sorry, you know. <laughs> That's, that's church people, you know? yeah, yeah, you got to love them. You know, I, I understand them. I grew up with them. I used to be one. But anyway, then I got found, okay? So what I'm telling you is just realize that that's what fellowship is about. Another thing you need is we don't want to target lost people. We want to make them projects. We simply want to be friends with them and hope if they're interested that we'll be able to tell them about a God who loves them and a Savior who died for them. Listen, the reason we can understand all this is what? Who are we? We are lost sheep. Huh? Is anybody, anybody here born without sin? Anybody here never have any problems? Anybody here never drift away? Man, if you did form a line at the back, we got a bus to take you away from here because you're, you're in the wrong place, my friend, okay? That's not us, okay? We are all have made mistakes, me most of all. The good news is, is that God came and found us and he brought us home and we can all, all come to know the good shepherd. That's the, that's the deal. There's a place for you here, whether you're lost, found, or somewhere in between, you're welcome. This is a safe place. This is a place, it's a home away from home, and it's a place where we can all be found by the Good Shepherd. And some of you right now, maybe you're still really, really lost, and, and you're saying, man, I just don't buy a thing you're saying. Hey, you're still welcome to come back. We love you. Or maybe you're, you're a lost sheep, and, and you're still lost, but you're beginning to hear the voice of that shepherd. He's getting closer all the time. I'm, I'm thinking maybe he's going to pick me up. Or maybe today is actually going to be the day you get found. I'm going to show you a prayer in just a minute. If you pray this prayer and really mean it, I believe something supernatural will happen in your life and God will come into you and you'll be, your life will suddenly change. Not dra it's not like you're going to win the lottery or anything, but you're going to feel a presence you've never felt before. You're going to understand things in the Bible you couldn't understand before. You're going to have a different attitude when you wake up tomorrow, I believe, as a result of what's inside you. Or maybe, you know, this happened to you a long time ago. And, and you, like me, are just kind of grateful and thankful, and we're just, you know, up there on Jesus' shoulders just riding along, you know, going, wow, this is great, you know? I love this. We're going to get home one of these days, okay? Listen, the good shepherd comes for all of us because he lays down his life for what? His sheep. Look at this prayer. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray it out loud in a minute. It's not a magical prayer. You pray it in your own words. You can change it. You can put yourself in there. Maybe all that doesn't apply. But it goes like this. Why don't you bow your heads? Let me just pray this aloud. You pray this quietly in your own heart. And then I believe good God will do business with you. Pray a prayer something like this. Dear God, I feel like that lost lamb today. I'm confused. I'm alone. I'm frightened. I don't know what's going to happen with my job. My family's in trouble. My life is a real mess. If anyone ever needed found, it's me. I don't understand everything about you and, and Jesus and the Bible. But I do know I need to be forgiven. And I long to know you're real. I'm desperate for your help. Please give me the faith to believe in Jesus. Forgive me of my sin and come and take ownership of my life. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.